I love wine. I love the heritage of wine. I don't want to give up wine. And why should I have to if I just want to give up alcohol? I could create something that wasn't yet available in the market, but I knew people wanted. And I'm obsessed, right? I'm, I'm obsessed with terroir. I'm obsessed with vineyards. I'm obsessed with grapes. I'm obsessed with clones. I'm obsessed with quality. You probably have lots of people telling you like, hey, Rachel, this, this is not going to work. And then how you actually keep your mind uh, strong enough to keep it doing what, what you actually you believe is going to be the future. I don't care. This is my vision. This is my mission. This is my purpose. It doesn't matter what those, what anyone thinks they're going to miss out on the opportunities to serve the very people who keep them in business, their customers. This is the future of non-alcoholic wine. Hi, Rachel Martin. How are you? It's a pleasure to have you on the Being a Visionary podcast. So I'm how are you feeling? I'm feeling <laughs> great, Priscilla. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm feeling a little chilly uh, because it's cold over here. I'm, I'm in New York City. Um, so, so yeah, I'm feeling a little chilly, but I'm feeling very positive. <laughs> so, right, so I read about you. Your story is amazing. I really think that's going to be inspire so many uh, other wine businesses, um, not only in Australia, but globally. So thank you so much for accepting this, um, this interview with us. But tell me, like, your story on I mean, your family, you you from like a photography and and down to your winery in the Foxwood in Virginia and Middleburg and 15 years of making and working as an executive vice president in the winery but really what did you do right well when I uh so I was on the founding team of my family's winery my stepfather, he owns it. And um, he asked me when he was just ideating Boxwood, if I would be the executive vice president and run the business for him. At that time, I was in the photography industry. Um, and you might, meanwhile, I have a background. I'm a fine artist. I have a background in art. I had a love for wine. Um, thanks to my parents who introduced me to French wine first, um, but very fine wines. Um, so I had an opportunity ahead of me to uh, enter the wine industry at you know a very high level career wise. And I couldn't think of a reason not to accept it. Um, so, so that's how I first got into the business. So, that just started, okay, we're going to plant a vineyard and build a winery and you're the executive vice president, great. So then I went in uh, to school. So I went to get an education in wine. First, I went to Napa Valley College for um, classes in enology and viticulture. And then I went to the University of Bordeaux School of Enology for a sensory diploma. And after I, finished my studies, then I went uh, back to Virginia to uh, be on site to grow grapes and, and make wine. So I was in charge of all of the vineyard management and the team under me. Uh, also the winemaking, my winemaker, um, we made all of the wines together, the first vintages of Boxwood. But it wasn't just that. Um, I had to figure out how to do all of our licensing, um, not the licensing of the of the winery, we, we hired a lawyer to help us with that, but all of the licensing when we started shipping our wines from state to state, I built our social media profiles. It's when everything was just new, you know, so this is 05, 06. And then um, let's see, I, I designed our labels, I did wow. uh, compliance, so I learned compliance with the Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureaus Bureau for our labels. Um, ran the tasting room, uh, you know, and anything you could possibly imagine. Uh, built our distribution, did self distribution, licensing to self distribute. See, we were in Northern Virginia, so distribute into. Um, 
parts of Maryland and Washington, D.C. So I, I learned everything about the wine business, uh, grape growing. We were sustainable um, uh, farming and, um, you know, hands-on winemaking. When we first started, it was about 600 cases. Now Boxwood is at 5,000 cases. But I was literally punching tanks down. You know, I was picking fruit. I was deciding when to pick. And um, so that was my entry and um, how I built my uh, career in wine. But more than my career is building, you know, who, who I was and what my attributes were and how I could contribute um, to making great wines at, at Boxwood. And then, of course, we started exporting. So I was doing our export to the UK and to Canada, um, wow. you know, working with journalists. So a lot of media relations, so pretty much at everything at Boxwood. It was, it was amazing. Was it? Oh, yeah. And then I, I established <laughs> Middleburg, Virginia <laughs> as uh, Virginia's seventh American viticultural area. Uh, I was a sole petitioner on that. And that was established in 2012. I had started it in 2006. So the whole process took six years. Took six years to actually get to your AVA and Middleburg and Virginia. Yeah. Wow. And you was the, the first one to fighting for, for that AVA. Uh, for that AVA, I'm, I'm the only person on the petition. So I, I wrote it myself. Um, I worked with soil scientists, um, county soil scientists and a state geologist to put together, you know, some of the soil information, but I researched all the climate and all the other, you know, things that you need to do for an AVA. But yeah, the history and the naming and I, I did all of that. And then what's the other wineries in the region? Did it help you at all? Or um, no, it? but I didn't ask for help, frankly. Um, I, I contacted every single winery asking them their uh, interest, you know, their support. Are, are you in support, not in support? Um, and I kept them involved of, of the stages, how the process was going. So I, I didn't ask for help. Nobody offered any help. Um, they just said, great, go for it. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's easier that way uh, to get, get things done quicker. Yeah, you're very brave. Uh, what's the most biggest challenge you overcome on these 15 years of experience with the, your family business, like at the Boxwood Winery? What's the, what's the I, I mean, biggest building, challenge? If I was marketing, building? Well, I mean, building a brand. Uh, building a brand is the greatest opportunity. Um, so when you build a brand, you build a community. And it's not just about making sales. Um, it's about offering a service, being part of the community. And that's really come back to us. Um, so we've been very successful at branding. So I would say the greatest challenge is always the greatest opportunity. And um, we we're very successful at that at Boxwood. Amazing. And why you took it like you take the, the step to leave your, the family business to do your own? So yeah, now we have some a passionate story as well there. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, I'm just, a, I've always been a, what they call a self-starter. And <laughs> I've never needed anyone to tell me what to do or uh, anything like that. Um, so, and I'm obsessed, right? I'm, I'm obsessed with terroir. I'm obsessed with um, vineyards. I'm obsessed with grapes. I'm obsessed with clones. I'm obsessed with quality. So when I, you know, and I was in Virginia for quite some time. I, we started our first vintage at Boxwood at 2000, in 2005. Um, I founded Oceano in 2016. So after, you know, 10, 10 vintages, you know, you know, you just have your, your mind open, your ears open. Any, I just, I'm always looking for an opportunity. So I was invited to visit Spanish Springs Vineyard uh, in San Luis Obispo, California by the owner of the vineyard. He is 
my father-in-law's neighbor and very good friend. So through my husband, who we were just dating at the time when we co-founded Oceano Wines, um, but my husband had mentioned to me, oh, you know, my dad's neighbor has a vineyard. You should make wine from there, you know? And I was like, oh, that's so cute. Like, whatever, you know, I didn't know anything about Henry's Vineyard, I, nothing. And then when I finally, that was in 2015. And then finally, 2016 came around, I met Henry, I met Henry Warshaw. And Henry just wanted me, he's so proud of his vineyard, Spanish Springs Vineyard. He wanted me to visit because, you know, I grow grapes too. So I did, and that changed the course of my life. Um, it changed the course of my business life, uh, my career. And so I, I visited Spanish Springs Vineyard. It is the closest vineyard to the ocean in the state of California um, in the San Luis Obispo Coast ABA. It's a mile and a half from the ocean. It's an ancient seabed soils. Uh, so marine shell, limestone, sandstone, fossilized shells, coolest climate for grape growing in the state of California below the fog line. So all of these factors just blew my mind. And I, I had to make wine from there. I could envision the flavor of the wine that I wanted to make uh, from the vineyard, just simply standing there. Uh, so I contracted for six tons of Chardonnay before I left San Luis Obispo to go back to Virginia. And that's how I founded Oceano Wines was because I just had, I just had to, it was a calling. Um, I knew I could make wines, California wine that was unlike um, the, your typical California wine that had bracing acidity and light on its feet without sacrificing depth. So that's, I just knew Spanish Springs my relationship with Spanish Springs, I could create something that wasn't yet available in the market, but I knew people wanted um, because I wanted it. It's amazing. Your, now your husband, so Kurt Dayton, so he knew that it's going to happen when he introduced you both? Or, or, or not really no, no. I mean, he was, <laughs> he's probably <laughs> wishing he never had just kidding. Um, you know, Kurt, after I, I was living in Virginia, Kurt was living in New York. That's why I live in New York city is because I married Kurt, um, in 2018. So I went back to Virginia and I called him up and I said, Hey, do you want to get in the wine business? And, um, I, he was, of course, you know, at the time we've been dating for a year and a half and he's totally in love and it's like, that's a great idea. What it, I'd love to. So that's how Kirk got into the wine industry. He's um, a musical theater producer and, and uh, it has a lot of projects, but that is the world that he is in. And um, so he's a co-founder of Oceano Wines. Uh, and then of course I moved to, I expanded upon it uh, with Oceano Zero, which is a completely my own, my own project. Um, so Yes, Kurt co-founded Oceano Wines with me, but I, I, I am the driving force behind it. Yeah, so it's, he brings something different to the brand because he has just a musical actor. It's completely different background. So how how they can influence um, the brand if be being different so much in the different brands in California? Yeah, well, um, Kurt has uh, had a, a company that he recently sold a record label called Ghostlight. And Ghostlight records original cast recordings of musicals. So his infrastructure, his designer designs our label. So the woman who designed all of his records is our label designer, um, his bookkeeper. You know, so he helped me with that back of the house, like infrastructure. So that is his contribution. And then, you know, he had his own business for over 20 years. So I, I leaned on him a lot um, for when we founded the company and I, and I still lean on him for 
you know, I bounce ideas off of him. He's a creative like I am. So we kind of like combine our creative forces to do something, you know, different, unusual or unexpected. Um, the reason I really wanted to have you in our podcast, because we just wanted talking about different visions for the future and the wine industry. It's because you actually bring something completely different. You bring into the wine industry um, the actually luxury, not alcoholic wines, uh, ultra premium, not alcoholic wines. Um, uh, for me, this is quite a visionary <laughs> uh, idea and a, quite a big vision. And I would love to explore that topic with you a little bit more. Because I think in the industry, you're going to see lots of people love the idea. So many people don't like the idea. And then I wanted to hear from you, like you, how everything is started. And why do you really believe that to be the future and your vision about non-alcoholic wines? I think whenever you have controversy like that, you know you're on to something big, that you're on to something good and I think change is good. Um, I founded Oceano Zero. It's kind of a long story. Um, it's a great story. I, I was in a, an entrepreneurship program uh, with Goldman Sachs called Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses in um, the last quarter of 2022. And the purpose of the program is to find an on, uh, a growth opportunity for your business. And, you know, the wine industry, there's, it's not really growing. Um, so I thought, well, maybe non-alcoholic is a growth opportunity for Oceano. I, you know, I'm always, I'm very observant. I heard chatter about non-alcoholic wines, new brands. Um, so I was in a discovery period. I live on the Upper West Side of New York. There's a store near to me called Boisson. Um, they carry exclusively adult non-alcoholic beverages. There are five locations in New York. So I started at Boisson to taste my way through all the non-alcoholic wines that were in the market. So I, I, I did, I did that in November, December of 22 and there was no, there was nothing I could relate to, you know, everything I tasted, tasted like bulk wine. It tasted like inexpensive wine that was being balanced by sugar or masked by sugar or doctored by CO2. Um, <laughs> And so it, my immediate thought was, what am I doing here? Like, this isn't for me. I'm a fine wine producer. I am, terroir is everything. I, I care about soil. I care about the weather. I care about all these things. Um, and none of the labels told me, where's the vineyard? What is the vintage? Uh, what is the heritage? Who are these people that... In, there was no story. Um, so, right. So then I, I thought, what the hell am I doing? Oh, excuse me. What the heck am I doing? Um, so uh, that was my moment. And I was like, well, that is exactly why I need to do this. Because I need to bring fine wine to the non-alcoholic category. Because people like me who want to reduce their consumption of alcohol their standards of taste for wine are very high. And these products that I'm tasting in 2022 just aren't cutting it. So that's why I need to do this. It was a calling. And then, so I graduated from the thing and um, I had my project and yeah, so I graduated with my growth opportunity and then I went right into it. So I had, um, I had wine in barrel. So I had 2022 wines in barrel while I was doing this. So I decided this isn't just an, an academic exercise. I'm actually going to make this wine. So this non-alcoholic wine. So January, 
participating in Dry January. So um, it changed my life. It changed my mind, I guess. And I realized how much alcohol, what a negative contributing factor alcohol was to living my best life. I am not sober. I am what I call sober curious or um, uh, conscious consumption or whatever, mindful drinking. I, um, I now, now that I'm free from the burden of alcohol, um, meaning a burden, meaning um, I don't feel an, I don't feel addicted to alcohol. Whereas when you drink every day, okay, uh, you're, you, I've been in the wine industry for 20 years and I was drinking alcohol before I got into the wine industry. Not until did I, did I separate myself from consuming alcohol? Did I really understand the impact that it was having on my life? So I had this revelation and I became my own customer. I've, you know, I've had the greatest wines of the world. I want to make non-alcoholic wine that will satisfy my own palate and those people like me who've decided alcohol is taking, you know, um, is going to be put, they're you're going to have boundaries, okay? You're setting boundaries with alcohol. I'll drink it on the weekend. Or I have wellness goals, right? So what is what is alcohol doing to my body or whatever? I love wine. Um, I love the heritage of wine. I love the hallmarks of wine. I love the flavors of wine. I don't want to give up wine. And why should I have to if I just want to give up alcohol? So when I'm making Oceano Zero, I'm making our wines with the same fruit as our traditional wines, which are you know, highly rated, award-winning, all of that. Um, and I'm using the same oak programs. So all of the costs are the same going into my non-alcoholic wine. So that when I de-alcoholize them, I'm not left with a bad product. I'm le left with a high quality product that's absent of alcohol. So what we do to balance it is we add less than one gram of sugar. There is five calories per five ounce serving uh, of, in Oceano Zero Pinot Noir. So we're only adding sugar. The wines are dry. If you taste it, you're, you're not even going to, you won't detect sweetness. It's just not there. So that's, that's my vision <laughs> for wine. <laughs> That's amazing. It's really amazing because I, I need to agree with you. Like we did some blind tasting when I worked for that retailer, like the biggest retailers in Australia. We did like a blind taste with so many non-alcoholic wines. And then I had the same problem as you have. With like we had like about 30 um, non-alcoholic who actually sold on the different um, different stores because we have about 250 stores in Australia. Um, and then we tasted, did a big tasting with the other wine merchants. And then we taste you all of this 30 and then most of them was exactly how you describe it was lots of sugar no flavor um was no really something you really wanted to buy in the hurry at all like yeah. I, yeah. we didn't have any quality there so i really appreciate you you actually used the same great to use for your alcoholic wines because i i in Australia, at least in my experience, it's the same. And so I can't really find people really care as much about non-alcoholic wines. They're just using whatever the grapes is there to put some sugar and that's it. That's the product for people. And, you know, people speak here today, uh, at least in Australia, in my experience in the wine industry here um, and in Brazil and in, different, in Argentina and South America, people really wanted to buy one is to be able to have a good experience and then they don't right want something right. like yeah i think you yeah and that pairs right. well with food you know it, it's all let's all, let's remember food because that's how we enjoy our wines at the table right so you don't i'm i have a glass here and so when you um when you taste oceano zero pinot noir 
it's wine. Okay. So all those na naysayers that say it isn't wine, that's absolutely untrue. Um, you start with grape juice and it goes through a chemical change, a chemical process to make wine. Just removing the alcohol doesn't change its state of being wine. It's just wine without alcohol. So our non-alcoholic wine smells like Pinot Noir. Uh, it tastes like Pinot Noir because it is Pinot Noir. We're not adding grape must to sweeten it. So there are a lot of non-alcoholic wines that taste like grape juice. And that's because they're using grape sweeteners or other fruit juices to sweeten the wine. I'm not interested in making a wine cooler, a non-alcoholic wine cooler. And a lot of these non-alcoholic wines are derivative. So they're adding juice to them and they're proxies. And they're, they're a lot, a lot, there's a, a lot of variety within what we call non-alcoholic wine. But we're making, of course, this fine non-alcoholic wine, um, which we also have the... Uh, the vintage 2022 Pinot Noir, the vineyard, Spanish Springs Vineyard, and the region, San Luis Obispo Coast, that's the AVA. So this is less than 0.5%, it's 0.47% alcohol. That, this is the future of non-alcoholic wine. There's always gonna be the lower end wines. And that's what's gonna build the market. So, you know, they, let's not call them lower end, less expensive. I don't want to uh, offend anyone. So those lower price point, non-alcoholic wines, you know, th thank you because they're getting, they're getting in the door, right? So, um, you know, some of the brands that have gotten a lot of um, attention um, being in, you know, UK, big UK markets, um, that's a necessary step and people are going to want to level up. And that's what Oceano Zero is here for, is when people want to have a fine wine experience without the alcohol. You use it like single vineyards, single, like if actually, single vineyard, only if been you know, handpicked handmade um i'm choosing the yeast people like the people behind the wine who made the wine you know who who picked the fruit um so actual you know winemakers making non-alcoholic wines and not just as a a consumer trial you know this this project oceano zero has heart i am looking after the the consumer who's looking to reduce or eliminate their alcohol from their lives. Um, so this isn't just a, 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 a test, you know, this is, a, this is something to support. I'm going to be at Unified uh, on a panel um, next week, a, a week from Tuesday. Um, speaking in the winemaking track on no and low alcohol winemaking from a terroir perspective. And um, this is what you're going to see. This, this is the future. This is the vision for high-end non-alcoholic wine. And then what do you believe we like in the market? If, because we now, we need to engage with the younger generation because they are drinking, they, they drink so much other things at the moment, or most of them they're not drinking, they reduce with a lot of heat. That's, that is why you you wanted to have a product and a good premium product, no alcoholic wines, is because you wanted to engage with the younger generation. Who is your target for the no alcoholic wines? I mean, my target is probably something to the nature of 35 to 65. So I don't know if that's younger drinkers or not, but when, and I'm, I'm not looking at it like it's for younger drinkers or older drinkers or 
the fact of the matter is people are drinking less alcohol and they want to reduce alcohol. They want boundaries from alcohol in their lives. And so the younger generation who maybe didn't drink like we did in I'm Gen X generation didn't drink like they did. Um, maybe they're looking for um, that, you know, they're um, consuming other substances. Like, I, I don't know why it's not alcohol. Maybe they just want to live their lives without being, you know, uh, using a, a substance to like chill out or what, whatever it is. This is just, this isn't about the Gen Z or whatever. Um, I'm, we're just, we're here when you want a high quality luxury product that, um, you know, that won't kill you, you know, <laughs> because I mean, alcohol is addicting, right? It's an addictive substance mm -hmm. and drinking a lot of it is bad for your health, you know, and people are waking up to that. So drink less, drink better. Um, and once, I mean, the, it's an adult flavor profile. So this is not going to be, you know, a soda type of experience. So it's not necessarily like for a younger palate, it's for a sophisticated palate. So maybe the non-alcoholic wines for the younger generation, depending on their ability to spend, um, might be those lower price point non-alcoholic wines. Um, but this this wine is for special occasions. It's for people maybe who just want high quality things only, um, a, a celebration. Uh, so um, so I respect the Gen Z, Gen X like me, millennial. All of us are trying to limit the consumption of alcohol to live a healthier life um, inside and out um, mentally and physically. Deal with the other wine producers probably around you that don't believe in your vision. So because you probably have lots of people telling you like, hey, Rachel, this, this is not going to work. Hey? And then how you actually keep your mind uh, strong enough to keep you doing what, what you actually you believe is going to be the future. There are some really, there's a lot of negativity going around in the wine industry about non-alcoholic uh, beverages, dry January or whatever. And I think it's fear. I think people are afraid um, of, of change or that non-alcoholic somehow is going to take something from them. Um, or they are uncomfortable with their own relationship to alcohol. So they're angry with people who are reducing their consumption. You know, it's, if someone is hating on a non-alcoholic wine producer because they think it's ruining the wine industry, um, that just might be reflected something that's going on in their lives that they need to work on. Yeah, so you don't really try to, to find... I don't focus anything. on it. I don't care. I don't care. When I first started, I had that thought. I was like, hmm, what are other people going to think of me, you know? And then <laughs> when I started the Dry January, and it was like, I don't... This is my vision. This is my mission. This is my purpose. It doesn't matter what those, what anyone thinks. You know, and they're just going to be late to the game. They're going to miss out on the opportunities to serve the very people who keep them in business, their customers. Yeah, love, I love that. Um, I, guess the, I guess you need to be brave to be able to embrace something new in the wine, in the wine industry because the wine industry has been so classic, so traditional for such a long time. And that's why I wanted to ask you how you're dealing with all these comments, the negative um, thoughts about no alcoholic wine, because because you, you do, and you do a luxury, and you innovate the industry, you probably get a, a lot of that that 
messages or comments it's like it's gonna tell you to give up you know and then it's very good to have you as a brave woman to to be able to inspire other producers to tell like if you really believe in something just just do it because that's your vision lots of people are going to see the same thing it's amazing thank you so much for sharing that but oh, yeah. what actually make it all shared is so different i like it from other brands like what is the steps you wanted to give uh, for people really have the vision but don't want it to like what they need, what is step is to be able to make it that vision to actually actions like you know, how you did with the Oceano wines and the Oceano Zero. Um, you have like a vision to make your wines Chardonnay Pinot Noir from the coastal area, like in in, San, in California and San Luis Obispo um, coast, and and then and that and then and afterwards we did the Oceano Zero. But everything is done in, in your mind. So what's the transition? What's the steps? then Rachel took from taking all those faults in the mind to actually make it real, to make it that brain, to make things work. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, there's a lot, uh, there are a lot of steps. Um, <laughs> so, you know, first it's I, I identifying what your vision is, right? Uh, so say you want to be a wine producer, for example, um, you have to decide what what are you contributing to the industry that is missing. You know, you have to have, there has to be a reason, a purpose. Um, and then, you know, uh, speak to as many people in the industry as possible. So find, you know, mentors, um, join groups. Uh, I would say getting a consultant uh, to start your business would be a very good idea. Um, um, so, and then looking at your marketing plan, you know, like I, I said with Boxwood, the greatest opportunity is to build a brand. So I would focus on that, um, building your brand, having a purpose, building a brand, um, fitting a market opportunity. So all those things are quite important. Um, reaching out to me is a good way to start. So if somebody has any a question of that regard or where do I get started or how do I find a community or, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Priscilla, if you want to share my information, I, I certainly can help people along the way to get in the right direction. What is, um, for a final advice for everyone, um, really wanted, and I guess one of the things we wanted to help it, like the community of the wine business, is because lots of people are struggling at the moment with different things like sales is going down um like the wine it's 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 we need to reshaping the the industry with the new ideas with the changes we all know that but some people are really taking longer to to actually take the first step um but what is the i wanted to you be able to give it like the wine pieces um, the wine industry advice it how we can actually be together, create a community together to be able to make it wines um, for the future, like to be able to see the opportunities for the future and then what we can do today, what's the advice we can do today to, to be able to help the wine business to keep it playing inf infinite game. We don't want the wine industry we, we really love the wine industry. We wanted to keep the wine industry alive forever. So what's your advice for, for the wine business? I mean, I would say um, uh, sustainable practices. Um, so whether it be sustainable packaging um, and, um, you know, taking care of the planet, of course. You know, there's a lot of talk about or problems or um, pricing, you know, things are getting more and more expensive. Um, so maybe being transparent about pricing structure and what goes in. So if you're gonna be sustainable, 
and you're actually looking um, at paying people a living wage and offering benefits and uh, education, multilingual education, certain things like that, it, there's, there's cost involved. So um, paying people well, <laughs> paying them their worth, um, if, and, and charging more for, for your, your product. So doing the right thing and figuring out how to structure it into the pricing of, of your product. So I, I would say that is one way uh, for the wine industry to stay relevant um, is to care for the planet and the people. Uh, packaging, so lighter weight packaging, you know, we all know like heavy bottles are done. There's no, no need for that. Um, cans, all of those things, they, they all have a, a place. So, you know, figure out what you do best, <laughs> do, you know, stay, stay in your lane. Um, if you are looking to go beyond the wine, consider non-alcoholic wine. Um, if you're, I think it's a really good idea or low alcohol wine. If you're a restaurant, you know, and you're you're worried about non-alcoholic industry taking money away from your, you know, your checks, offer more non-alcoholic options. We are going to pay the same amount for a wine with alcohol than a wine without alcohol if the quality is there. So for the wine industry, just be open-minded, you know, consider everything. Um, but first consider the planet and the people, um, serve your customer, um, look, look for your, who you're leaving out, you know, look for your customer that you aren't serving yet. Who can you bring um, to either the winery or to the wine club? Um, but you know, let's share share ideas, share information. Go to Unified if you can symposium, and let, let's let's talk about the wine industry and how to make it better. But I, I think I think the future of the industry is uh, non alcoholic. And love that, and I love you your message as well. I'm gonna take away that message from with me. Take care of planet and take care of people and making communities and take care about your community. I think giving back to the community is a great, great, great message. Thank you so much, Rachel. I think you very inspired. I really love to be able to have a talk to you and then to be able to explore the luxury uh, zero alcohol wines with the Oceano Zero. Um, I'm sure people are going to ask me about your details, wanted to know more about it, and I'm happy to pass uh, over and then to share that as well with the world. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Priscilla. Pleasure to be here.